this fancy suite today It's gotta stay that way For all the kids that'll come along Good soil is the way Not a chance that I've been got Just one that's come my way Let's come together and sing along Say la 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 take your seats. Uh, it's very difficult to follow, uh, to, to follow that, but um, uh, a, v a very good morning to you all. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to see you here uh, at the University of Birmingham. My name is uh, Professor Robin Mason. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor International at the University, and I'm also the Director of the University of Birmingham India Institute, uh, through which we manage and coordinate all of our engagement with India. We're absolutely delighted to host this event here in our great hall, in which over 2,000 outstanding Indian students have graduated over the past century. And the great hall has seen some very distinguished Indian speakers delivering lectures here, the latest being esteemed Minister Hardeep Singh Puri, the Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas and Minister of Housing and Urban Affairs, of the government of, uh, government of India. As I mentioned, the University of Birmingham has engaged with India for more than a century since our first cohort of Indian students attended the university to study for degrees in mining and commerce, graduating in 1909. And we continue to be one of the most engaged universities with India. We have uh, each year over 100 students planning to travel uh, pandemic permitting, planning to travel to India for study this year. We have over 40 joint research projects currently ongoing, and a fact that I'm really proud of is that the research that we do with our Indian partners is really of the highest quality. It's cited over 11 times the world average. And we currently have at the university almost 300 Indian students studying here and over 60 members of staff from India. So it's fitting, I think, and a great honor for us to be hosting this distinguished event today here at the University of Birmingham. I'll shortly be inviting onto the stage our two honorable guests for today's event. They need very little introduction, I know, but nevertheless, I thought I'd say just a few words. Sadhguru is a yogi, mystic, visionary, a two-time New York Times best-selling author. Ranked amongst the 50 most influential people in India, Sadhguru is known as a speaker and opinion maker of international renown. He has been conferred the Padma Vibhushan, India's highest annual civilian award, accorded for exceptional and distinguished service. On, later this month, on the 21st of March, he will launch his new Save Soil movement, aimed at bringing attention to the devastating impact of soil degradation around the world. He will be a lone rider on a 30,000-kilometer journey across nations that will end in southern India, 
where the Carvery Calling Project, an offshoot of the Rally for Rivers, initiated by Sadhguru himself, has enabled some 125,000 farmers to plant 62 million trees to revive soil and the river Carvery. The Save Soil movement seeks to bring about a conscious response to impending soil extinction and is supported by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, the World Food Programme, Faith for Earth, the United Nations Environment Programme, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, among many others. Our second distinguished speaker is Lord Karen Billamoria. In 2006, Karen Billamoria was appointed the Lord Billamoria of Chelsea, making him the first ever Zoroastrian Parsi to sit in the House of Lords. Another first, as Lord Billamoria, he was the first Indian-born Chancellor of a Russell Group University in Great Britain when he was installed as the seventh Chancellor of the University of Birmingham in July 2014. He is also an honorary captain of the 601 Squadron of the Royal Air Force. He's the founding chairman of the UK India Business Council a Deputy Lieutenant of Greater London, one of the first two visiting entrepreneurs at the University of Cambridge, a founding member of the Prime Minister of India's Global Advisory Council, and the current President of the Confederation of British Industry. In 2008, he was awarded the Pravasi Bharti Saman by the President of India. So, to fabulously distinguished speakers for us today. Before I invite them to the stage, we'll watch, we'll watch a short video as a preface to their conversation. Sustainability is an issue that confronts us more now than at any time of human history. We are all acutely aware that every action we perform now will affect positively or adversely future generations of this planet. And this is why sustainability is the theme of the, 2000, uh, the, the 2022 Commonwealth Games, which we'll be hosting in Birmingham in a few short months' time. We, this generation, have the unique opportunity to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And one facet of sustainability that is often overlooked is soil extinction and desertification. A teaspoon of soil contains more organisms than there are humans living on Earth. But it takes a minimum of 500 years to form one inch of topsoil. Yet in the UK, intensive agriculture has caused arable soils to lose somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of their organic content. And that led the UK's Environment Secretary in 2017 to say that the UK is 30 to 40 years away from the fundamental eradication of soil fertility. So let us now watch a video that explains the science of the purpose of the campaign Save Soil. We are talking about climate change, carbon emissions, and global warming and various other aspects, but we are not addressing soil. Soil is the habitat upon which zillions of lives thrive. Once there is no richness in soil, then you have forsaken the planet in many ways. Every responsible scientist in the world and the UN agencies are clearly saying we have only 80 to 100 harvests left that means approximately 45 to 50 years of agricultural soil left on the planet. By 2045, we will be producing 40 percent less food than what we are producing right now, and our populations will be 9.3 billion people. The food shortages that could manifest in the next 25 years, the consequences of that is unimaginable. Civil wars will unfold across the world once there is food shortage. What we are facing now is soil extinction. 
Why is soil becoming extinct? Where is it going away? What is happening to our soil? We must understand if you add organic content to sand, sand will turn into soil. If you remove all organic content from the soil, soil will become sand. In normal agricultural soil, the minimum organic content should be between three to six percent. The most minimum is three percent. At least this minimum to keep the soil alive, to keep the soil as living soil is a must. Agricultural soils across the world, the depletion is so heavy. In most countries, more than fifty percent of the topsoil is already gone in the last hundred years. The nutrient levels have dropped significantly. The level of micronutrients you would get from your food in early twentieth century to what you are getting from the same food now has dropped ninety percent. If you ate one orange in nineteen twenties, what you got from it, now in twenty twenty, if you have to get the same, you will have to eat eight oranges. This is what we have done to our food. Soil is the biggest ecosystem on the planet, and so few people know anything about it. One teaspoon of healthy soil probably contains more microbes than there are people on Earth. The microbial life in the first twelve to fifteen inches of topsoil is the basis of our existence. It is this magic beneath our feet which has produced the life that we are. This first twelve to fifteen inches of soil is the basis of life for eighty-seven percent of life on this planet, including you and me. We have to begin to recognize that what we call our soil, Mother Earth, is a living organism. Open soils ripped open by plowing, open to sunlight, is the basis of destruction of microbial life. So the focus should be on agriculture, the focus should be on seeing that land is under shade as much as possible. Some kind of shade, grasses, herbs, bushes, trees. Conscious Planet is launching Save Soil Movement to bring about a policy change to regenerate soil as a part of this <laughs> I'm sixty-five and I'm riding thirty thousand kilometers, a lone motorcycle journey, thirty thousand kilometers across twenty-four nations to activate support from the citizenry to assure the governments long-term investments will be appreciated. So it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if you do the right things now, in the next fifteen to twenty-five years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another thirty to forty years, after forty years, if we attempt this, then it could take hundred and fifty to two hundred years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From twenty-first of March for one hundred days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. We must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen. Many global leaders and influencers are already participating in the movement. Be a part of this and let us make it happen. From my part, uh, as much as I can contribute. We're going to save the soil. Do your part. And saving the soils. Our future, our children's future and our planet's future depend on it. Save the soil. We know what we must do, so let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make, let's it, make it happen. happen. Let's, let's make, make it happen. happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen.
So now it's my great pleasure to uh, invite up onto the stage Sadhguru and Lord Bilamoria. Sadhguru, welcome to the University of Birmingham. Welcome to all of you uh, to the University of Birmingham. I'm usually on stage over here during the graduation ceremonies uh, when we, our graduates come up these steps and uh, shake their hand and they formally become graduates of this great university. Will I also have the privilege? Now, um, on that note, uh, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but thank you. It's a great honor for us that you, you are here with us. And, and you, know, you heard from Professor Mason, our, our Pro Vice Chancellor in charge of international and also head of our India Institute. And being the first Indian origin uh, Chancellor of a Russell Group University in, in Great Britain, I said, we've got to have an India Institute. And uh, our High Commissioner, Yash Sinha at the time, I said, please will you launch it? And here we are. And, in the history of the India Institute that it's been there, I think this is the highlight event that we have today. What, what I would like to say at the outset is, Sadhguru, you're somebody that I've had the privilege of meeting years ago, first time in Parliament, <laughs> when my friend Dinesh Damija brought you, and, and I'd heard about you. Now, of course, you are probably the most famous Indian, one of the most famous Indians, not just in India, but in the world. And what I've noticed about you that is phenomenal is you are an incredible communicator. Uh, and you always, from what I've heard over the years, speak, speak sense. And what you're doing today is really important because people like you who have a wonderful following of millions and millions of people um, is one thing, but what do you do with that? And what you're doing with that is so important with saving the soil. Uh, at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, in, in the UN Climate Change Conference in November, I don't remember. I spoke at about 30 events. I was there for one and a half out of the two weeks. Nobody spoke about this. The word Nobody soil was spoke. not mentioned, that's what I heard. Nobody spoke about this. If only they could have seen this film at COP26. So I think what you're doing is phenomenally important. Please tell us that, uh, for those of you who don't know your story, when you started your, 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 your yoga work and then led to planting trees, which has now led three decades later to this. Namaskaram to everyone. <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> people ask me how I became an environmentalist. I think being an environmentalist or an ecologist is a quite an obscene thing because we are the ecology, we are the environment. Unfortunately, we've become a virulent part of the ecology. This is one thing we must realize, the very body that we carry is soil. We're just a pop-up on the planet and we will pop out. Most human beings, generally on a day-to-day -day basis, they're completely unconscious of their mortal nature. So they naturally forget where they came from and where they will go. Just a reminder, this is not a morbid pleasure that I have, just a reminder, you're just an outcrop of the soil, you're up here and prancing around, you shall get back there. Hello? So. This is not... this is not a way of seeing the limitations of life. This is the way of celebrating that our time here is very important. This is our time on the planet. What we do here is the nature of the planet. What somebody has done in the past is their time and they did what they knew best. 
what we know best must, we must do now because this is our time. And our time is not too long. Even if you live to be hundred, it's not too long for human potential. It's very brief. You would have noticed that time is a very relative experience. On a certain day, if you're very joyful, one day, twenty-four hours, passes off like a moment. Another day you're a little depressed. One day feels like a yawn. Hello? Time is a very relative experience. So, only miserable people can have a long life. <laughs> if you're joyful, it just gets over before you know what's happening, <laughs> really. <laughs> before you figure out what is what, it's gone, all right? So, in this brief time of our lifetime, what are we doing? There are many things we can do. We come to the university, we get ed... I didn't, but I'm saying, I'm talking about the educated lot. You come to the university, you get educated, find jobs, make families, build wealth, live life. All this we do. But as a link in the chain of humanity that we are, as a generation of people, the most important thing is to always see that the next generation has opportunity to live a little better than us. Hello? That's every parent's aspiration. But right now, that is what we are not taking care of. All the soil facts, I can throw you, oh, I, I can throw at you any number of, uh, you know, terrible facts. But essentially the fact is this, we have been destroying the source of our life, which is soil. Our esteemed vice chancellor said something which was very amusing for me. There was a time in this country for everything people were saying, God willing. Just now I heard him say, pandemic permitting. <laughs> this is an evolution <laughs> So uh, your children may have to say, maybe we'll have lunch, microbes permitting <laughs> Because the microbial life is so much a part of our within, in, of our innards and of the soil because as a life, as a person, you may have all kinds of imaginations as to who you are. But as a life, you are just a reflection or a consequence of what's happening in the first twelve to fifteen inches of the soil. That's all it is. And as uh, he was mentioning, to form one inch of soil, it takes five hundred years. That's how much has gone into it. Even in the evolutionary scale of things, you're a consequence of their activity. Without them, you wouldn't happen to put some things into place. See, the life as we know it has happened. Because microbial life evolved to more complex functions, one thing that happened People say, the scientists say, maybe a billion years ago, whatever number of years, some smart fungi or algae figured out how to make cook their food with sunlight. You know, solar panels, you heard about this. Like some man or woman, you know, it's always said a caveman, but I'm giving a fair chance, maybe it was a woman, because she <laughs> discovered how to use fire to cook their food. We don't know how many years ago, but whatever. Like that, some very smart algae or fungi found out how to cook their food with the perpetual energy of the sun. Today we call this phenomena as photosynthesis, I see a lot of green shirts, but that won't help. <laughs> so then came the green leaf. 
photosynthesis is the greatest phenomena happening on the planet. Because of that, at that time before photosynthesis started, the oxygen content in our atmosphere was just a shade over one percent. Today, it is around twenty-one percent. Only because of this oxygen content, you and me can exist here, all the complex life forms can exist here. So life as you know, the life that you can see, there was life that you could not see, even now, even now we're talking about life that you cannot see when we talk about the microbial life. Today, of course, you respect that life a lot because of the pandemic. Hello? Deep respect. <laughs> you even started saying namaskaram to people <laughs> So, that life was there, but the life that you see in the form of worms and insects and plants and animals and humans happened only after this particular invention of a particular fungi or an algae which discovered how to cook their food with sunlight. They started absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and started cooking carbon sugars which are very essential for them to pass it on to the ground to get nutrients from the other microbes which need the carbon sugars. So this is not simply given, this is a marketplace, hard bargaining is happening, very, very sophisticated and complex marketplace right beneath your feet, something that you cannot imagine. Trillions and zillions of organisms gathering around specific species of plants and doing a whole trade-off. If the plant doesn't have the cash, which is carbon sugar, none of them will give them nutrients. Today you know, if you don't have enough gut microbiome, no matter what best food you eat, you cannot really digest and assimilate the nutrients into your system. The same is true because you are just a consequence of that. As complex as your body is the soil, or probably far more complex than your body. Maybe the body has become a little more sophisticated, but the soil is far more complex. So this is what we're talking about. As uh, Lord Curran said, that there is a world environmental, you know, the mega conference, COP26, correct number? Correct. Okay. And I met some environmental ministers from different countries. They said, we were there for a whole week, Sadhguru. Nobody, we never heard the word soil. Said, when to people are talking about climate change, when people are talking about global warming, how come you're not talking about soil? Because exposed soils, plowed soil and paved soil are the two main problems on the planet which account for forty percent of the global warming and you don't talk about it. Then I inquired into this, people who are there, various activists and others, I, s I inquired, why is it we're dodging soil? What is the what is the thing behind this? Then they say, Sadhguru, if we find natural solutions, all these oil companies will get away. Wha what's happened to us? Is it always about fixing somebody? Is this what our life is about? Always fix that guy, fix this guy, punch somebody in the face, is this what it's about? Oil company is not drinking oil by themselves, all of us are using it, all right? Hello? The simple way to close down oil businesses, you and me don't use it if we are capable of that. We are not capable of that, all of us drove in here, yes or no? Hello? But we like to make somebody else the culprit. No, consumption is by us, production is by them. It's like blaming the butcher for the meat that you eat. Hello? He's doing the dirty job for you. That's all it is, isn't it? Hello? Somebody is drilling oil, somebody is digging out coal because we are using it or no? All of us as a generation of people, every one of us is responsible for what's happening. Yes, somebody may be doing less, somebody may do be doing more, but if you want to just punch people in the faces, it clearly shows you're not interested in a solution, you just enjoy the problem. You are making a living out of the problem, 
that's all the problem is. If people don't understand what is climate change, let me give you a simple example. You don't have to study all the science. Ah, uh, in England if it's sunny, you say it's a gorgeous day. Uh, like today. <laughs> we come from India, <laughs> where uh, sun is on for us 365 days. So in the summer months, if I make you stand in the hot sun for two hours and then let you come under the tree shade, you'll understand climate change. <laughs> Clearly under the shade, it's a different climate, yes or no? This is all every other organism is asking for. The microbial life needs protection from the sun. Now we are not only providing the shade, we are plowing it up, ripping their homes open. Today modern machines are plowing anywhere between twelve to fourteen inches, completely overturning the soil, leaving it open to the sun for months on end. This is an absolute murder of the soil. That's what we're doing. Now, we are here simply because one aspect is oxygen in the air, that's happened only because of photosynthesis. Synthesis. One simple way of looking at it is, five hundred years ago, how much photosynthesis was happening on this planet? Thousand years ago, how much photosynthesis was happening? Today, how much photosynthesis is happening? Can you make a guess what is the drop? Hello? Eighty-five percent. Eighty-five percent drop. So you're busy talking about carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, the problem is oxygen depletion is happening. Till you become breathless, you won't know. And it will happen. Because the photosynthesis is dropping dramatically because there's no green cover. If you want to see what it is, right now there was a map out there which was showing all the brown patches on the planet. All that places, no photosynthesis is happening, that's what it means. No green cover means no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis means we have closed down our oxygen plants, literally. That's what it means. Everybody, there are a whole lot of internet uh, scientists, or I would say WhatsApp scientists, they read a message on the WhatsApp and they suddenly, you know, become doctor ecology or something. They're all, if you utter the word carbon, say, oh, poison, poison. We are all carbon life. Hello? You and me are carbon. Every other life that you can see, a worm, insect, bird, animal, tree, everything is carbon. So what we call as life itself is a carbon chain. In this carbon chain, one of the key links is soil. It has more than three times the carbon that the atmosphere holds. Right now the problem is carbon is in the wrong place because sequestration is not happening. Well, are we burning fossil fuels, fuels, are we filling the atmosphere with this and that? Yes, definitely we're doing that. Is that a problem? Yes, it's a significant problem. But to turn that back, what do you want to do? People say, Sadhguru, my friend has an app, I was in California for a month. Sadhguru, my friend has an app, it will sequester all the carbon. See, you may have technologies to enhance application. But there is no technology to revive the soil, to enhance photosynthesis, to put back oxygen in the atmosphere, there is no technology. You can use technology to enhance application of the process. You cannot, there is no such thing as a technology for that. There are only two ways to enrich the soil. Enriching the soil means essentially you're feeding the microorganisms. That is, green litter from the vegetative, uh, you know, vegetative life and animal waste. There is simply no other way. Now on our farmlands, there is neither trees or any other vegetation, nor is there any animals on the farm. We become machine friendly. Once you have worked with a machine, it does everything much faster. No farmer is going to go back to working with an animal because it's too 
you know, it's different, it's another time. So, it is very important that every farm needs to produce a certain amount of organic content for its own land. Because right now farmers are bringing cow dung or something else from a faraway place in a truck. So obviously what they apply is too little. Microbes are starved. Once they are starved, nothing grows there fully. But we found another alternative solution. Maybe in most parts of the world, somewhere around forty-five to sixty years ago, we discovered these fertilizers and fertilizer usage. And we saw crops were dropping, then we threw these fertilizers into the land. In many places, the yield multiplied three times over. Three hundred percent increase in yield happened. We said, okay, we found a magic powder. You put this and everything will happen. This is just like you are healthy and doing well, but you went to the doctor, the doctor said, see, your uh, vitamin B6, B12 is not good, your calcium is not good, your iron is not good, so I will give you these three pills, take it for two months. This was just supposed to be a bridge for you to cross a certain situation. But you took these three pills and next day morning you felt like a superhuman being. So you decided this is the real good thing, instead of three I will take thirty and I don't have to eat anything. That's exactly what we have done to our land. For that we are paying a price. We need to put back organic content. Now, we are not advocating any particular kind of uh, agriculture. It's not my business or your business sitting in a university hall to tell the farmer how he should grow his crops because I have been on the lands, I've worked on the land. I know how heartbreaking it is. And it's not simple to make a crop out, you know, to this magic of making food out of mud is not a simple thing, it's a very complex process. Just because he looks little illiterate or uneducated, we think he's a fool. No, it is a very complex process if you have an MBA or even if you have a master's in agriculture. I will give you a piece of land, please grow me five different kind of crops and show me, you will see you will be a disaster. Yes, but this is happening, for example in India, Sixty-two percent of the land is having organic content less than point-five percent on the verge of desertification. And we have done some kind of a survey because we are working with large-scale work with farmers. Not even two percent of the farmers want their children to go into farming. So in another twenty-five years when this generation passes, once the skill of making mud into food goes away, what are we going to do with food? People say, I will grow vegetables on my wall. You know, I was in California and this guy is telling he's done something miraculous. I go there to see and uh, he's grown turnips on his wall. <laughs> I looked at this and said, is this a solution for the world? Then you'll have to build walls everywhere. Of course, somebody wanted to build a wall across the country and maybe you can grow turnips on it on both sides <laughs> So these turnips are all overripe. And say, why have you not either eaten it or sold it or something? He said, no, lot of people are coming, they want to take pictures. <laughs> oh, yes, it works as an exhibition, but it's not a solution. See, anybody who thinks there is another solution other than soil, is a fool because it doesn't work. Can I say a little story, sir? Please, please. This happened in 2060. A few scientists from Birmingham University <laughs> saw... <laughs> it's okay, huh? <laughs> sir, you have a competition university, I can name them. <laughs> Competing university, is there? <laughs> Many. <laughs> <laughs> so, they sought an appointment with God. They got the appointment, being Birmingham, they got the appointment. And uh, they went there and said, hey old man, you've done pretty well with creation. But you know, now everything that you can do, we can also do, it's time you retire. God said, oh, is that so? What is it that you can do? So they said, look at this. And they dug up some soil, made a vague shape of a human child, and they did so many things to it and within a few minutes the child became alive. 
God said, oh, that's really impressive, but first get your own soil. Fantastic, that's great. this is amazing what you've just told us. If I may, in the UK, the UK recent report from our government that intensive agriculture has caused arable soils to lose about 40 to 60 percent of their organic content. 18 percent of the organic content present was estimated to have been lost just between 1980 and 1995. And according to our environment secretary, who said this in 2017, the UK is 30 to 40 years away well, you fired. from the fundamental eradication of soil fertility. Now, they're saying all these things in 2017. No, whoever said that, was you fired from the government? No longer in the job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's all these facts that you've said... No, I can say all these because they don't have a job. <laughs> But here they are saying these things, but no one's taken any notice of it. No, and because there are lobbies, as I said, in COP26, if you don't say it, where do you say it, I'm asking. Yeah. Isn't that the place to say it? But if you don't say it there, where do you say it? Why are they not saying it? I inquired into this, why is it? They're saying, no, 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 then oil companies will go loose. What is this? You don't want to solve... you have cancer, but if you sneeze, they won't let you into the theater. So, you focus on not sneezing. But the... what... <laughs> <laughs> but if, I, if I may ask, the, the power that you have, the power that you have is... you've got a voice, people listen to you, and what is your legacy? Your legacy looking ahead, people say, ah, oh, this superb, amazingly wise, sensible person who changed many people's lives, but this is a legacy that is going to affect the whole future of humanity. Now, you're setting off on this ride um, on the 21st of March. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but the 21st of March is the Parsi New Year. It's Navroz, the first day of spring. So thank yes. you for choosing that day. <laughs> and even more important, if you may indulge me, my younger son, Josh, it's his 21st birthday oh. on the 21st of March. <laughs> so, thank you for choosing a very auspicious How did day. you time that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was the, he's the third child born on the third month, and 21 is in 2001. Everything to do with him is 333. You know, the devil is meant to be 666. I say, you're half a devil, 333. <laughs> the other half, he's a lovely chap. So... Uh, but with it just, with, if I may ask you, before we go and open it up to questions, I'm a, a See, When somebody calls somebody a devil, a lot of transformation will... Can I tell you a little bit of my story? <laughs> Is this okay with you? <laughs> yes. So this happened when I was twelve years of age. I was in a school, once in a way. <laughs> I was going there only when I had to. Uh, by then, one thing I had realized was, I don't know anything. I don't know anything means, I don't know anything at all. If I see a leaf, I'll be staring at it for hours because I don't know what it is. I, if I see a glass of water, I'm looking at it all the time because I don't know what it is. I know how to use it, but I don't know what it is. Even now you don't know what it is. It took me some time that human beings have come to terms with their ignorance. They have no... you know, with all the scientific exploration, we still do not know one atom in its entirety. We know how to use it, fuse it, break it, all that stuff, but we don't know what it is. So I'm still paying attention to the world. I have nothing much to say. So many days used to pass without me uttering a single word. So I'm in school and this teacher is trying to one afternoon, trying to get my attention, he's asking a question. I am paying attention to him, I can see him. I can see his past, present and future, but I can't hear him because his words mean nothing to me. He tried this for about thirty-five, forty minutes, out of sheer frustration, he came and held me by the shoulder, shook me violently like this and said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you're the later. <laughs> so that's when I... till then I was confused about everything in the universe, what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that. 
I had no answer for anything, nor did I find anybody who had any sensible answer except quoting something else and something else. Only thing I knew was, this is me. Suddenly this guy confused me about this also, I looked. <laughs> Is this divine, is this devil, what the hell is this? <laughs> so that is when I started closing my eyes and my journey began. So half a devil is a good place <laughs> Well, <laughs> so, you, Sadhguru, you have preempted, if I may ask a, a, a personal question, is where did it all start, this journey that you're on now, this journey that's going to lead to this journey of three and a half billion people being made aware of this particular message. For you, I mean, you're, you're one of the most enlightened people, if I may use that word, that I've come across. Uh, the other was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who sadly passed away recently. I, I found him very enlightened. Now, he was a great communicator. You're a great communicator. Where did it all start for you? Where, how did you become what you are now? If you can explain that, that I, inner journey. Have I done something wrong? That <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're talking about my ecological research. You can talk about that as well. <laughs> so they... because I was... Uh, they say that I was too active at home. So my mother's health was going bad because of something and she already had... you know, I'm the fourth of the four siblings. I'm the last of the four siblings rather. And uh, tending those, sending those three children to school and managing me became too much, so they put me to school when I was three and a half years of age, some kind of school, I know what it was. So there is a maid who holds me by hand and takes me to the school and leaves me inside. So I made a deal with her, you are not going to come into the school, you leave me at the gate. So she left me at the gate and uh, the moment she turned her back, I went around and I found at that time, I thought it was the Grand Canyon in southern India, okay, not in Arizona. <laughs> and there, uh, there were all kinds of creatures and uh, then I, you know, my father being a physician, there were lots of empty pencil in bottles and things like that, so I collected a whole lot of species and stored them up where nobody can see in the house. Three and a half months of my research, they disrupted. And they said, he's playing in the gutter somewhere. Look at the insult <laughs> I was researching in Grand Canyon and these people catch me and they say, I was playing in the gutter. So what I'm saying is, people asking me, Sadhguru, how do you know all this? See, the thing is just this. I have lived on this planet for six and a half decades. So I know what's happening here. It's not by reading just by being open. Say, oh, we all lived on this planet, how come we do not? No, no, you did not live on this planet, you live in your head. You have invested too much in your psychological space. I got nothing here, so I live on the planet. I crawl on the planet like a worm. You ask a worm, does he know what's the soil condition? Hello? Does he know more than the scientists in the university, what is the soil condition today? Does the worm know better or the scientist know better? Please tell me. So I'm just a worm. So this worm knowledge, it suddenly become valuable in the world, I'm glad <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, we have a limited amount of time. Would you mind if we ask the audience yes, to ask some questions? Ask them not to ask difficult questions. Don't ask difficult questions. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, if you could put your hand up. Uh, and I'll try and, and uh, oh, Professor Mason is here, so do you want to conduct, uh, please? I'll do that so that you two can concentrate on, um, on responses. So uh, what I'd add, we'll have microphones coming round, I can see lots and lots of questions. Uh, we'd like to get as many as possible, so if I could encourage you to keep your questions brief, if that's all right. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to choose people slightly at random, there's a, a, a chap in a grey top just there, right in the middle. If you could wait for the microphone to get to you, please. People may need to help by passing the microphone along. Thank you. Yep. Sadhguru, first of all, good morning, Pranam. And 
Since I have the opportunity of asking the question to you, I know we are talking about soil, but I couldn't resist asking this question because this has been bothering me for a while. I found my way back, after all these readings, I found my way back to our culture where we talk about, there's a sadhana we talk about that not all of us today have the convenience of having a guru. Not all of us can go out on the spiritual path with a guru leading us, guiding us on that path. And we talk about sadhanas where life, in a way, becomes your guru. I don't know much about that, but I have been very intrigued by this question that is this possible? Because we cannot find authentic gurus that we can go to and just, just for, for, to, for, for guidance, I mean. See, you're talking about find, making life your guru. The only place where people get lost is life. Hello? Did you get lost when you were… before you were born? Or did you get… did anybody get lost after they are dead? No, they only get lost in life. And uh, in this terrain, if you make that your guru, oh, you will have many things. If you want to learn with life, then you will know everything about life the day you're dying and it'll be of no use. You must know life or how to live life before you start it. Hello? Hello? If you… if you buy a new phone, you should read the user's manual within the first three days or after three years when you're discarding it. When should you do it? User's manual is meaningful within the first three days so that you can use this well. So this life, if you want to learn with life, well, you will have the wisdom on your deathbed, which a whole lot of people have, but it's no good, it's too late, because life is all about time. There's only two things you have in this life, a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. When it comes to time, it's rolling away, since we got onto this dice, we are nearly one hour closer to our graves, all of us. Yes or no? That's a fact. Oh, why are you saying all this? Whether I say it or not, you are <laughs> This is the nature of life. Time is rolling away all the time without our permission. Nobody can say, oh, yesterday I didn't do enough, let me rewind yesterday and do it again. There's no such thing. Time is just rolling away, so you have no control over it. The only thing you can control and manage is by enhancing your energies, you can crush the time a little bit. What somebody does in five years, you may do it in one year. That way, you live little more. But you cannot enhance time, isn't it? You may live healthy and roll the time little more. But time is running away all the time, whether you sit or stand, sleep, do whatever you want, it's running away. So don't get into all these... These are all in fancy magazines, they are talking about spirituality. Life is your guru. Oh, oh, fine, all the best. See, I trek every year in Nepal and Tibet. This Sherpa guy was absolutely illiterate, all right? He doesn't know one alphabet in his life. He carries my bag and he's walking in front of me. He is born and lived in mountains. And if there is a fork, uh, he will say, hmm, I just take that instruction. If I say, why not this way, he says, hmm, hmm, <laughs> just go. In that terrain, if I say, I am the guru man, let's go this way, well, maybe that's the end of your life, for all you know. So in unknown terrain, it's always best you take the hand of somebody who's already walked the terrain. That is all the whole business is about. And one second, uh, about, uh, about these days we don't have access to guru. No, no, I want to tell you, only these days you have access to guru. Never before was this possible. Many great beings have come, when they spoke hardly ten people heard. Today we can sit here and sp speak to the entire world, we can connect with the entire world. I want you to know this is the privilege of twenty-first century population, only these days 
can you connect with guru wherever he is, otherwise... Very good. There is... Uh, there's a lady on the second row here, on the left as I'm looking. Again, if you could, a microphone is speeding its way towards you. To your, to your, to your left, madam. Thank you. There we are. Namaskar, Sadhguru. My name is Shubha. I have one question for you today. Um, being in the UK, uh, I could feel the carrot sambar is not the same back in Chennai. No, you should never here. make sambar with carrot. It's a wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What's it doing? <laughs> It's the radish, not the carrot. It'll never make good sambar. I'm a good cook, I'm telling you. <laughs> no, I just said carrot as an example, but any vegetable I no, bought in the shop. You should shops. not use carrot in the sambar. <laughs> <laughs> carrot is my favorite sambar because it's quite sweet. <laughs> Then I would say you should make cabbage pudding. Right. <laughs> no, I... I guess I have eaten one in some of the restaurants. Probably, yeah, you're right. No, I'm so, saying you have come to UK and you're destroying my favorite sambar. Oh, lightly. <laughs> but my favorite sambar is uh, mango drumstick uh, okay, okay. sambar. That's but we fine. Don't... We're not going to sambar. Yeah, come to the question. Yeah, but we are not getting. <laughs> but that is much more horrible because it's been imported with no nutrition at all. Right, Carrot right. sambar come is to the much question. better. So. Yes, so when I came to this country, I miss my food a lot because whatever I buy here is all looking bigger and genetically modified, doesn't have any nutrition, flavor or health benefits. I could find tremendous changes in the food I started eating when I came here in 2008. Question, question, question. Yeah, so wherever I have to go and buy, I have to buy fertilizers to put on my grass and everywhere, you know, to get my... Stuff. Question, question, question. Come What to the question. we should do, yeah, thanks for attracting a lot of millions of people, you know, to get the focus on soil today. So how can we play a major role at our individual day-to-day -day life or in our own space, how we can help to bring this, um, you know, back to life, you know, that's mm -hmm. my question. So you knew this meeting was about soil, but this is the first time in many years I'm seeing, I'm sitting in a hall where uh, at least uh, 25 percent of the seats are vacant. This is the first time in many years I'm in a hall like this. So for that I'm holding you because probably you served them carrot sambar, that they're not coming here anymore <laughs> Why I'm saying this is, please understand this, this is a generational responsibility. Whether we act now and do the right things and become that generation which withdrew from the brink or become a generation which slept through and went over. Is sleeping a bad thing? Is sleeping a crime? Hello? Is sleeping a crime? No. But if you slept through your life, you will become a disaster for yourself and maybe everybody else. Yes or no? Right now, that is the problem. What can I do? Well, you all know what you can do, but you ask me because you are hesitating to do what you can do. Right now, these hundred days, that I am on the road, there are many things to this hundred days, it's not a joy ride. Thirty thousand kilometers at sixty-five is not a joy ride, don't think motorcycle is a luxurious thing because some idiots in the social media say, oh, he's riding a luxury motorcycle <laughs> Are, is there something called as a luxury motorcycle? Your backside will fall off. <laughs> yes. So, you know what to do. Today you have so many means. See, some people are covering their face with a phone and constantly looking at me through the phone. It will be on the YouTube, why do you waste your time? It'll be there immediately, it's live telecast, webcast, sir. I'm telling you, it is live webcast, it is on the YouTube, why do you waste your time recording on your silly phone? No, I'm sorry, smartphone <laughs> Don't waste time like this because this is the whole problem. We think we will accumulate everything and do it at the end of life, okay? Even this whole aspect of education, we think we'll accumulate everything and then use it one day. That's not how life is. Life is happening now. It needs to happen now with the fullest possible intent and expression, isn't it? So these hundred days, I'm telling you Shubha, right? Shubha, 
Birmingham, you are the leader. Hmm? As long as you promise them you will not serve that sambar, <laughs> they will listen to you. Hello? <laughs> so, today there is social media, there is every YouTube, there is all kinds of mediums on the planet. This is the first time you can communicate. This many people here, two hundred people, I'm telling you, if two hundred people commit themselves for one hundred days, we can reach three to four billion people on the planet, just this Birmingham population here. Yes or no? The question is only will you do it or not? Because you think it's my campaign, this is not my campaign. At the age of sixty-five, for who I am, I can live comfortably. People will take care of me wherever I go, I don't have to own anything. Wherever I go, whichever part of the world, people will take care of me extremely well and there will be no food shortages for me. Twenty forty-five, I have to just die ten years early not to see all those horrible things. This is not my problem, but you, your children, this is the problem. When you see these children's faces, how do you manage to do this? People ask me, Sadhguru, why are you doing such a thing? I said, in India they were asking me, I said, three hundred thousand farmers committed suicide. What else does it take to wake you up? Hello? What is it? What else does it take to stir your humanity? You can also eat your carrot sambar, all right? I will not come in the way. I only said don't serve others because they may think Indian food is so bad <laughs> So when I… before the next question, I went to boarding school in Uti in Tamil Nadu. They served carrot. And, and the, the food… And it was an international boarding school and they served in those days British food at its worst. Boiled meat, boiled potatoes, it was, you couldn't eat it. So every Saturday I'd get on a cycle, go into Uti town and eat five masala dosas with Ooh. lots of samba. <laughs> well, do you know I, I cooked with one of the famous British chefs, what's his name? Uh, Ramsay. <laughs> and uh, I was certified as I make the best masala dosa in the world. Can I have some? You have to come. I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> Very good. I'm going to take… If uh, I can just say one more thing, sir, please. Of course. See, this is a moment in our life because on an average, according to UNFAO, twenty-seven thousand species of organisms or species of organisms, species, not organisms, are going extinct per year. Twenty-seven thousand species are going extinct per year. At this rate, in another thirty to forty years, we will reach a place where if we want to regenerate soil, it will take hundred and fifty to two hundred years. Do you know what the… what kind of disaster it is? But today if we do it, in the next ten, fifteen or twenty years, we can make a significant turnaround. That's why it is now. For our generation, this is a challenge and this is a privilege that it's, a, it's in our hands that we can turn it back. I hope we make use of the privilege. Very good. Uh, I'd like to go to this side of the hall, if I may. Um, again, forgive me, for, I'm not going to manage to cover everybody, but there's a lady in a red top, four rows back, I think, if you… See, it helps to wear red, huh? <laughs> Namaskar, Sadhguru. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you for the impact that you've had on my personal journey, and I'm sure other people will um, feel the same. Um, my name is Suman, I don't know if I said that. <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you was, um, obviously you go through life uh, and you are, uh, you have a lot of wisdom and you have a lot of control over your own emotions, your mind. I wanted to ask how you keep motivated. Obviously you're full, you're here where people are very supportive of the message that you're putting across, but I'm sure you've met people who haven't been. And how do you control that frustration that, look, this is what's happening, um, you know, why is this not happening? And how do you stop that from demotivating you in your journey? You know, like, what, this is very hard and how am I going to do this? These people aren't listening and this is very sad. This is what I wanted to ask. Just watch me. 
<laughs> what do you think that is? What do you think that is? <laughs> Compulsiveness. Okay. It is not that you don't have, you know, body doesn't itch somewhere, it may. If you're in a public place, you'll do... Will there be a video? You won't do like this, right? Hello? So there is a itch, but you know how to respond to it, not compulsively react to it. You know that much, right? That much evolution has happened. Please stop, it's okay. So, see between a chimpanzee and you, not you alone, I'm saying human beings, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? So physiologically, that is how close you are to a chimpanzee, just 1.23 percent. But in terms of your intelligence and awareness, your world support from a chimpanzee. Now this is your problem right now. You have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough platform. If you don't stabilize this, the physiology of it, the chemistry of it, the energy of it, if you do not stabilize this, your intelligence is your biggest problem. Right now, that is what human beings are suffering. If they had the brain of an earthworm, they would be peaceful and they would even be eco-friendly. Yes? Right now, such a big brain, not able to handle this. Even now, if I slice off half of your brain, you will see you will become peaceful. Yes or no? So, first you tell me, is intelligence a problem or a possible solution? Hello? Intelligence is the only solution we have for anything, for any kind of problem. Addressing it intelligently is the only solution, yes or no? Hello? What has happened after the pandemic, you got a brain fog or something? <laughs> but right now, intelligence is the only problem that human beings are suffering. The sharpness of the intelligence is poking them all the time. If you remove half the brain, they will all be peaceful. Just see, it took millions of years of evolutionary work to get you to this place of intelligence. And today you suffer that because your societies, your education systems are not teaching you anything about how to handle this one, how to conquer the world, everybody is talking about it. How to handle this one in a way it benefits you and benefits every life around you, there is no such anything in the society. So, you are suffering that that right now you evolved into a human being. What this means is in the evolutionary process, you are on top of the world. Hello? Compared to every other creature, you are on top of the world, but you are not feeling on top of the world. You are feeling miserable. No other creature on the planet suffers as much as a human being, isn't it so? Their suffering is purely physical, if you harm them physically, they will suffer. If stomach is full, they are fine. For you, if stomach is empty, only one problem. Stomach is full, one hundred problems. So, this is a very basic existential issue within you. This is essentially because you have not built a platform to hold this intelligence up in a positive way. You call it stress, anxiety, depression, this, that, they told me there are seventy-two different types of psychological ailments. You can give it whatever name you want. The only thing that's happened to you is, your own intelligence has turned against you, that's all that's happened to you. You can call it by seventy-two different names. It's like God, you know, we have no... so many names. Just like that, you can call anything by any number of names. But there's only one problem your own intelligence is poking you, isn't it? If somebody is troubling you from outside physically, that needs to be dealt differently, that's a different matter. But ninety percent, I'm just being generous to you, actually ninety-nine percent of human suffering is psychological, mental, isn't it? 
This is just your own inability to manage your own intelligence. So would you prefer to be an earthworm? Lot of people are saying, yes, that would be better. I also agree. So, right now this question came up, what can we do? Don't you know what you can do? You know how to poke yourself, but don't you know how to use the incisiveness of your intelligence for effect? Well, you can... every day you can inform at least one hundred of your... You have hundred uh, WhatsApp friends at least, even if you've not met them, I'm saying. Facebook friends, WhatsApp friends, tell them something about soil for next hundred days. Write your local MP, do something, write your Prime Minister. Right now, our Isha homeschool children, they have taken up the challenge that they will get ten million children in India to write to the Prime Minister that there must be something important about so... in the policy of India about soil. And already they're beginning to act. I'm afraid we have time only for one more question. And I understand there's a younger member of our audience who has a question for us. There we are. So uh, there's the microphone. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, my name is Vivon, and my question Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? is... There he is. Um, oh. How can we as children make the soil better? See, uh, fantastic that the concern has entered your heart. It should, because I don't know if you saw our volunteers wearing the shirt normally. Uh, hey, you come here. Yourself, the sitting volunteer, whatever, whatever his name. The one with the green shirt, one of you with the green shirts, come up. Turn back and stand this way, turn this way, yeah. You see the brand and the movement is all about save soil. Now turn around. Only the front side is save our soil because this is written by a child. Because right now, please, thank you. Because right now, the soil that we are consuming is the soil that belongs not even to that child. We are eating up the unborn child's soil right now. This is a crime against humanity. This is genuinely a crime against humanity. We are consuming the food of an unborn child. So, when it comes to children, what can you do? Before I come to that, I would uh, like to tell all the adults, because everywhere I go this is happening, let's go to the schools and build it up. Why? For the damage that you did, why are you going to the children? Why don't you do what you have to do? First of all, do not ever activate children below fifteen years of age in anger, in rage, in frustration towards something. Oh, because of this oil company this is happening, because of this political leader it's happening. Please don't do that because a child's way of processing their emotion is very different. If they early on in their life, if they become very angry people or hateful people or frustrated people, you will poison their life. When you're adult, if you become angry, you may have the necessary sense to bring it down. When you're child, if you become very angry, it will stay with you and it will poison your life all the time. So do not activate children in an angry mode. But now the child is asking a question, so many millions of children are asking me this question, I'm telling them, as a child, in your own language, you don't take assistance from your parents, you can ask them if you don't know the spelling of a word, just write a letter to your Prime Minister that you're concerned about your future in this country. In every country I'm saying this, you write this to your Prime Minister, you're concerned because this is what the facts of the soil are, soil is speaking. What is the answer? Let the policy makers think about it because you need to understand this. A elected political person is there only to fulfill the mandate of the people. People are asking for trinkets, they're giving trinkets. If you want them to do some long-term policy, the people should speak. This is what we want. 
In most countries, what I've seen when I meet the heads of state, they're not even... they don't even know that there is such a soil problem in their country, because nobody has spoken to them. Everybody is talking about what is... what about this, how can you give me electricity free, this free, that free, reduce my tax, this is what they're talking about. Nobody is talking about long-term well-being, because when you administer anything, when you administer a nation particularly, there is no nation with limitless resources. If they... they have to adjust the money around, move the money around all over the place to keep everybody happy. Unless people say, if you invest in something which will bear result after ten, fifteen years, we are okay. Unless you say that, why will they do that? Because their term is for four, five or six years and they are here to serve the people's mandate. People have to speak, isn't it? And children also can write a nice cute letter, not a letter of anger. Just saying that everybody is talking about this soil, this man comes from India, this, you, this uh, yogi comes from India and talks about soil, this is concerning me, what will we do about it? Please write to your prime ministers, whichever country you are, because prime ministers and presidents must know the population wants it, otherwise how will they act? They are only there to manifest people's mandate. People have to give them the mandate, not just by vote, but by voice. Professor Mason sa sadly said that's the last question, so we're going to have to bring this uh, session to a close. I just want to say, Sadhguru, you just mentioned something about being elected in a mandate. I'm very lucky in the House of Lords over here in the UK, you're appointed for life. <laughs> so it's a very good position to be in. And uh, um, I, if I may, I'm going to, I don't know if anyone's ever described you as an entrepreneur before, because you are a true entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs see problems, but they make, also see I, solutions, I don't and they make money. them happen. I don't make any money. <laughs> you, don't <have> to make, <laughs> you don't have to make money to be an entrepreneur. But it, you, you, here you are, you've identified a problem which nobody talks about. You've Talk to us about the solution and you're willing to act on it. And most importantly, you have the power, you have the power and the ability to influence not millions of people, but three and a half billion people over the next hundred days starting on Monday. We wish you every success. Thank you for being with us here in Birmingham. Thank you. If you give me just one minute, sir. I know you concluded, but uh, if you give me a minute. So this is not happening as an experiment with the farmers. For the last twenty-six years, we have manifested this with hundreds and thousands of farmers, where in five to seven years' time, most farmers, their incomes have gone up anywhere between three hundred to eight hundred percent by adopting the... a suitable agriculture with which a great enhancement of soil organic content happens, water tables come up, nutritional value goes up in the food and the prices go up for the farmer, the market value goes up and he's making more money. And many of them, because this is a tree-based agriculture, this is not the only way to do it, there, may, there are hundreds of ways to do it. We have produced a soil document, we will present it to you, sir, uh, which is specific to every nation. Depending upon the latitudinal position, the fourteen types of soils that we have identified, the soil type, the economic condition of a given nation and the agricultural traditions of that nation because even if you have any amount of science, you cannot change the agricultural traditions of a given country overnight. So taking all this into consideration for each specific country, one hundred and ninety-two different documents we have prepared in detail. That's excellent. We could go on, but unfortunately we, we cannot. Um, so I would ask that you join me in expressing our sincere thanks to Sadhguru and to Lord Billamoria for sharing their insights, their perspectives, their conversation with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd also like briefly to thank uh, 
the many volunteers, the small army of staff from the University of Birmingham that have made today's event possible. While we have been sitting here, almost 2,000 football pitches of fertile soil have been lost. So I'm sure, like me, you've been inspired to, by this conversation uh, to go away and make a real difference. So thank you all for coming to the University of Birmingham today to hear the wisdom and inspiration of Sadhguru. This very body is soil. My body, your body, everybody is just soil body. of soil is it turns death into life. Depleted soils will not quench the fire of hunger. Unquenched hunger can burn the very world. This is a generational responsibility. Save soil, let's make it happen.